Okay, so for the final part of this week's lecture, I'm going to just go over some uh, very recent and quite prominent sociological studies of um, digital culture and the internet in general. Um, and I think that it's actually important to provide some conceptual tools to think about this stuff to, I suppose, make the normal look strange. In, in many ways, it's quite incredible how quickly um, digital culture and, you know, the use of mobile phones and the um, the kind of ubiquity of social media, just how quickly those things have come to be, you know, very central in our lives and, and saturate our lives in many ways. Um, you know, just how normal it is to, you know, sit there watching TV while scrolling through Facebook or whatever. And um, again, these things were kind of unimaginable, you know, 20 years ago, I suppose. They've very quickly become to be like the new normal. So again, sociology is a good way of kind of thinking about um, how this came about, um, so the good things, the bad things, and I suppose what I want to do now is to think a little bit more critically about these new norms. So um, one prominent work has been about the, the what we call the ambivalent internet um, by Whitney Phillips and Ryan Milner. And Phillips has also got another book about trolling called This Is Why We Can't Have Nice Things. And I would suggest if you're interest, interested in these topics, you should check out all these books that I'm, I'm about to talk about. Most of them are written, um, you know, quite... Clearly, um, they're not particularly deeply theoretical or hard to read, um, and they have all kinds of really, I think, interesting analyses of uh, very recent um, examples. One of the points that Phillips and Milner make is that, you know, the kind of weird and wonderful of the internet, what they, some people call the brave new world of the internet, um, has become very quickly institutional. Um, it's very much generative, and it's constantly creating new things. It's all de so destructive of things, but it does these things all at once. So, in this way, the internet is both a new terrain of politics, it's a place where we can have kind of mundane, everyday conversations and communications. It's also, you know, a place of um, where people construct and present and perform their identities. Um, so in very much like I've been talking about so far, it's like a new layer, a new space to be able to do this stuff. The kind of where those traditional things kind of play out in real life, it's a kind of another space for those things to happen. And um, increasingly there's the blurred lines between those, those spaces. But what it, what it also seems to show is that um, those performances of ourself and our interactions and relationships with each other online don't necessarily replicate exactly how we behave, you know, IRL in real life. And they use the example of trolling for this. So much, you know, trolling is really offensive, obscene. Um, but they point out that what this actually does is it's kind of, it kind of expresses wider social impulses. What they call, call the grotesque pantomime of dominant norms. So in this sense, they talk about how trolling actually becomes a kind of um, expression of much of the underlying racism and sexism that actually exists in society. Um, and this is um, expressed through all kinds of, you know, trolling and, and memes and, and stuff like that. For, for others talk about how all this stuff kind of takes place, you know, in this very, very new space of the online digital world and um, conceptualise how this very much changes how capitalism operates, and I spoke about this a little bit earlier in the lecture as well. So one term that's come up here is the idea of platform capitalism, where traditional capitalism was about the kind of production of things, of stuff. Platform capitalism is dominated by these kind of monopolistic, um, you know, web pages and, and um, social media sites um, and services. Um, and it's within these kind of different platforms that much capitalist exchange now takes place. Um, for those that want to kind of talk about platform capitalism, it's the monopoly part is really important. Things like Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Uber, Airbnb, and the like, um, become to dominate much of the markets. And in fact, much of the market itself now takes place on those platforms themselves. What, what becomes really important here is that... Um, these places now become culture of itself in many ways. They're not necessarily um, places where culture happens, but they actually have a huge structural kind of influence on how culture is disseminated. 
how we experience it, how we relate to how we relate to it, and therefore these platforms have a, a real influence on our emotional lives and the way that we feel, you know, in our day to day. So while they're kind of huge and dominating, and um, um, for for uh, Cernak and others that write about this kind of stuff, this is also a kind of weakness of them as well because they're so reliant on our continued use that our refusal to to use them could bring them down, um, even though the the kind of likelihood of that is, seems, um, you know, relatively unlikely, I suppose. So this is a kind of way of thinking about how capitalism itself has been very, um, I suppose, productive and creative of, of new technologies. Of these things can, um, you know, make our lives easier and create all kinds of efficiencies. And this has certainly been the case throughout the 20th century with new forms of technology, things like washing machines, televisions and all that kind of stuff. But once we get to the point of platform capitalism, capitalism becomes more about the kind of walling off of ideas, the ownership of information and the dissemination of that data. These um, platforms really don't create new stuff. They often kind of um, recalibrate um, things that already existed. Um, you know, and as you see with the likes of Google and Amazon in particular, they keep buying up, um, you know, creative um, technologies and um, increasingly bring them into their own um, ecosystems. And what are all these platforms trying to do? Well, they're really just trying to kind of, um, I suppose, um, they, 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 our attention becomes the thing that they crave. So this is what's become um, known as um, attention economies, or Yves Sitong argues attention ecologies. And this is the idea that now that our world is so full of information, there's so many platforms and images and symbols, so many ways to communicate, and much of it is quite distracting, that while these platforms are very much about still selling us stuff, or at least selling us, our data as a consumer, they need to actually get our attention first. And much of the um, the investment that these platforms do is on ways of kind of attracting our attention, our attention, keeping us on that platform, um, and keeping us there over and over again to keep kind of scrolling, um, keep keep you know practicing on the platform itself. Now, economies of attention have always existed. Um, you know, there's ads, you know, ads and books and search engines and all this kind of stuff have always always kind of done that. You know, the things like um, um, signs on the side of the road, billboards, all these kind of stuff make up a kind of spatial ecology of attention. Um, and what Siton wants us to think about is the way increasingly this stuff happens online. And we know that, um, you know, these platforms use all kinds of psychological tricks and technologies to try and keep us there. Uh, in fact, many of the platforms use, you know, the same kind of psychology and um, reward systems that things like games and poker machines and stuff like that use. In terms of like the communication that's going on in these spaces, there's there's a kind of debate going on about um, you know very broadly here about how much you know things like trolling and memes and all that kind of stuff create conflict, and others argue that the kind of online life that we lead may lead may lead us to be kind of associating more with our in groups, um, leading to kind of information echo chambers, and leading us to be kind of living in what's become called filter bubbles. So this is certainly the case that as we click on things that we like, the algorithm more and more tailors what it delivers to us based on those likes, um, you know, and based on the people that we have relationships with, you know, on those platforms, our friends and friends of friends. And so the argument here is that this means that we're more likely to associate with people like us, um, only look at the things that we like, and therefore the information that we'll be receiving will be tailored more and more to, you know, that, that previous behaviour. And rather than the kind of old, you know, 1960s version of the more media, the medium is the message thing that we'll get, you know, more, um, the, the more we kind of um, associate and understand other cultures and more exposed to them through the media that we'll get along more and know more about them and things will be better. The filter bubble thing means that we seem to be being provided with things that separate us more and more because we're less exposed um, to information that we don't feel comfortable with. So you can see these 
you know, explaining that a little bit simply there. And obviously, there's lots of um, conflict that goes on online, and you can seek out as much information as, as you want about anything. Um, the filter bubble um, concept really kind of pertains to that kind of mass cultural dupe version of that people are likely to be passively um, consuming online and just kind of um, consuming the things that are fed to them. In a similar manner, again, harking back to the Frankfurt School, Dominic, Dominic Petman's work on what he calls infinite distraction is also a way of thinking about how um, the kind of social media and, and online uh, practices have become to dominate much of what we do in our days. You know, I think the average, you know, figures of how long people are spending looking at screens is anywhere from two hours to eight hours. Um, you know, it often seems that increasingly that people are spending more than half the time they're awake um, looking at various screens. Um, and, and these kind of theorists want to think about what are the implications of that and what they, particularly what the ideological issues with that. Petman talks about these as kind of emotional micro experiences. Um, basically, that what these things do is that we can be sitting there in our household where we feel like we're communicating with all these people online, but there's a kind of, um, I suppose, desynchronization going on. Um, the quote there, I think, is a good example. Um, the idea here that these filter bubbles become ever smaller. Um, we're infinitely distracted, where one person is fuming about economic justice or climate change one minute or another is giggling at a cute cat video, two hours later, vice versa. We're all kind of consuming these things, but doing it at different times, and there's no kind of commonality or community or kind of um, communication going on there. Much of this is, becomes distracting, becomes um, a way of kind of, I suppose, being an emotional about something, whether that's having fun or angry. But really what that means is it's just a form of consumption. We're just kind of scrolling through, looking at stuff, liking at stuff, being distracted, and not really kind of, you know, doing actual politics, doing actual work to make things better. And you can see here how this argument very much fits with the traditional Frankfurt School idea. Um, Wendy Chun has a similar kind of um, analysis to, the, to the, that, that, and what she calls in the book updating to remain the same. Um, and again, this is kind of relates to some of those social pressures of fear of missing out. We're ever trying to catch up with what's new, um, with what's cool, but really that's impossible because things change and happen so quickly that there's no kind of ever satisfying those desires. But what she, what I think she really interestingly points out is the way that we kind of see our devices as being personal devices, that they're kind of, you know, belong to us as individuals and we manipulate them as individuals to do what, you know, whatever we want. But really, as she points out, they're quite chatty and promiscuous. They're constantly sending us alarms to do stuff, constantly sending us notifications. They're constantly drawing us, whether that's our attention or your physicality, to the device to then, you know, continue on using it. So she points out here that, like, while much of the analysis of, you know, the media in general, as has in traditionally, but also more and more on the internet, on the internet focuses on spe spectacular things, spectacular events, you know, big arguments or the next big thing or whatever, Chan argues that basically when this stuff matters the most is when it doesn't seem to matter at all. It's a kind of those almost downtime, um, everyday situations that we use social media as kind of when we seem to be most immersed in them. And in relation to this, you know, argument why we're doing this, uh, Marcus Gilroy Ware argues that we do this to fill the void. Um, largely, he makes, a, again, a quite um, critical analysis of capitalism, that we're increasingly, according to Gilroy Ware, immersed in misinformation. Things like depression and anxiety are pretty much the most treated health conditions. Now, particularly for young people, the politics we're kind of all immersed in gets weirder and weirder, like things like you know, Trump and Brexit and all that kind of stuff. Things like climate change. Gilroy wants us to think about why we then become obsessed with this kind of social media world and what does that say about the human condition. And he argues it's a psychological response, a kind of almost like a, a need for pleasure and comfort that results from all these stresses that we're constantly immersed in. And again, this kind of relates a lot, I think, to that Frankfurt School arguments, but the interesting thing that 
um, Gilroy Ware says about this is unlike the Frankfurt School argument where we're kind of cultural dupes and blind to this and just nothing but kind of, you know, consuming um, ideologues, um, he argues that we actually do this reflexively, that this has been a deliberate decision that we make to kind of, you know, absorb the, uh, avoid those kind of uh, problems and we increasingly live this ironic life where we um, know about all this stuff going on, would like to do something about it, feel like we can't, so we just kind of immerse ourselves ironically and play online because this is a way of avoiding those stresses. This relates to, you know, uh, various analyses, um, or the structural analyses of mental health, um, things like what Fisher called depressive hedonia, um, but like rather than the idea that depression here is about this kind of inability to do things, um, what this gets turned on the head is becomes this inability to do anything else but to pursue pleasure. So again, I think this is a really interesting argument. So there's, you can obviously pick a lot of these kind of generalities apart with kind of more specific um, analysis and it'd be interesting to see how much kind of this kind of conceptual ideas hold up to empirical analysis. Um, but I, I'm presenting this kind of stuff to think about, I suppose, critically, making the normal look strange in terms of um, how, you know, the stuff we kind of do on our social media so often and don't kind of take for granted needs to be unpacked critically a lot more, I think. Okay, so to conclude this lecture on digital sociology, I just want to quickly touch upon how these kind of um, digital technologies have affected sociology, sociology itself. Um, firstly, you know, um, obviously research now happens online a lot more. There's a whole, um, a whole kind of array of new methods of collecting data, and not just big kind of quantitative data, an array of kind of qualitative methods as well. And whether that's participant observation in, you know, chat rooms or, um, you know, new ways to interview people and observe people or using the kind of affordances of the platforms that I've been talking about to um, participate with you know, research participants um, and get them to kind of, you know, post photos, post videos that express how they feel rather than just kind of the traditional interview. Deborah Lupton, who I talked about earlier in the lecture, is a very prominent um, sociologist in Australia in this area. And she argues there's four aspects of digital sociology. There's the professional digital practice, where sociologists themselves can share their research and network and do things like that. There's sociological analyses of digital media use, where we research the use of new media that relates to some of the concepts I've been talking about already. There's digital data analysis, and um, this can be both quantitative and qualitative, where sociologists use digital data um, as the object of their, of their study. And there's critical digital sociology, where we kind of increasingly coming up with conceptual and theoretical models to think about what all these kind of recent social changes around um, digital te technology have mean for, mean for human existence um, and how we can kind of generalise more for kind of understanding of what all this kind of stuff means and whether it's kind of good or bad, who benefits, all those basic sociological imagination kind of questions. I just quickly wanted to draw some attention to, some, to a really good example of, I think, what of digital sociology, and this is work done by Brady Robards and colleagues in Melbourne called Scrolling Beyond Binaries. Um, so if you're interested in to look, checking out what I think is a, a really well thought out, um, both conceptually and empirically, um, uh, digital sociology project, please have a look at that. <clears throat> okay, to conclude. So obviously digital media technologies have become central in the way we live and sociologists are you know, interested in um, understanding what this means um, from you know, critical points of view, from functional points of view and from symbolic in interactions points of view. Really all of those kind of theoretical perspectives that we've been looking at throughout the course are, are still very much useful for considering what's going on um, you know, online and, and in terms of digital culture. Much of the contours of inequality that I've spoken about through, throughout the course, like class, race and ethnicity, gender and sexuality and the like, also are very much useful concepts for thinking about who benefits on, online, you know, who has access to the, to the, you know, the right technologies, who dominates these spaces, um, who experiences discrimination and things like that. <clears throat>
sociology itself will need to constantly um, be self-critical about its own methods and its own kind of orientation towards the digital world because it happened because social change happens so quickly new technologies come along new platforms um, and all these things tend to mean that what happens on them is you know not always revolutionarily different than the previous um, versions of them but we still need to kind of do work to ensure that we're keeping up with those changes you know a good example of that is you know maybe in 2008 it would have been impossible to um, consider that you know myspace would just just disappear and not be a thing anymore um, people who are kind of you know coming into the early teens now probably wouldn't even know what myspace is so these kind of things come and go seemingly much more quickly now and kind of the rate of change in terms of sociology um, and the study of it becomes a bit of a difficulty for sociology because we tend to take quite a while to do um, social studies, whether that's you know designing a project or getting ethics clearance and all that kind of stuff. So sociology itself needs to maintain a kind of critical reflexivity to be able to you know keep up and be able to make meaningful interventions into understanding these platforms. Okay, um, I'm going to leave that there. Thank you.